school Thursday. On Fridays, when we'd like to get our contact letters out, um, and Dorothy's um, going to be part of that team. So if anybody would like to help with that, we'll have the addresses already on labels, and I'll have a letter done. And if you, we can just sit, put a little personal note on there, you know, it was great having you. Something, just write something on there, just to make it a little more personal to get those in the mail. And then also anybody that can come Friday and help. Um, break stuff down. We'll do some Thursday night, but we'll, um, we'll try to be real methodical and organized about taking it down so that it's not as hard to put everything where it goes. So we may end up doing some on Friday. I know it's 4th of July weekend. A lot of people are going to be out of pocket on Saturday, so any extra hands that anybody can lend, um, we would appreciate it. Yeah, yeah, that was what I had planned. I'll have it, it'll be up here ready for whoever can. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we'll probably just set it up in the fellowship hall. All right. Anything else to live announcements? know these verses and I need to know them because I can't read the small print. <laughs> okay, I'm reading from Mark 10, 13 through 16. People were bringing little children to Jesus had <clears throat> to have him touch them, but the disciples rebuked them. When Jesus saw this, he was indignant. He said to them, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them for the kingdom of <clears throat> for the kingdom of god belongs to such as these i tell you the truth anyone who will not receive the kingdom of god like a little child will never enter it and he took the children in his arms put his hands on them and blessed them Amen. Good morning. Good to see everybody. Let's stand and let's praise him this morning by singing praise him, praise him.
thank you for the good and wonderful day it's hard to enjoy and we know probably so many of them. It's beautiful in the sense that our eyes are seeing it, we've been delighted, Father, what we see when the sun rises. To the beauty of the nature and the pretty flowers, Father, you provide for us. Lord, it's what we know that's on the inside, the spiritual man, Father, the spiritual woman. That's most important. We pray, Father, that as you look down at your creation, you see us and you see those uh, your people, Father, and you're proud of what they are and who they are. And especially, Father, as we begin this week, we're here at Liberty with uh, Bible School. Pray you reach the blessings, Father, upon all the come, and all the teachers, and all those who are involved in any manner, any aspect. May be a special and glorious week. A week, Father, glorifies our you. We do pray again for our prayer list. Our special needs are there. We pray for all those that we know it's our duty and responsibility as your people, as Christians, and as citizens, Father, of our wonderful country. We pray for them. Take up the, the, the things, Father, that we see around us, and that we want to lay them at your feet. Ask you, Father, to intervene in the ways that are best. Help us, Lord, to be able to respond to those things around us in ways and manners that we can that are pleasing you. Forgive us those times, Father, we may run off on our own, those times we fail to ask your blessings upon what we do and to seek your guidance and direction. We know, Lord, we're not very strong in ourselves and certainly not very smart. We need your direction, leadership, power of the Holy Spirit, Father, at all times. We do pray for just a, 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 a glorious week in service and ministry. Beyond that, Father, as the summer continues to go, we ask you once again to be with those who are, we know, uh, some are leaving this week, but uh, the folks we know, Lord, are going to the various places to work and to serve and minister and help to other churches around the country. Provide safe travel for them and Lord, we prepare for hours. Just uh, thank you once again for letting us be a, a, your hands and your feet and uh, helping all those that we know our brothers and sisters in Christ and the church they serve. We love you. Thank you for all you do for us, our salvation, most of all for the promise you give to us. And uh, as I'm coming back again for us one day, Father, we look for that day and say to you, hasten, hasten that day, Father, you come again. That's our day. We see the joy and praise it from it all. We ask you for Christ's name.
praise in the gardens. Let's stand. And we're going to praise him for turning our graves into gardens.
Possibly not according to the tradition you received from us. Now, Bible school is upon us, and if anything within most churches can be called a tradition, it would be Bible school. Right. Now, remember when the years were still here on the choir hall, right. about where the time Israel there, and the, the, the elk over there. It's been how long? About 20, I don't know, more years. But I remember, I remember, I found a document hidden back here. This is the library. I found a document hidden in there that thanked Liberty for holding vacation Bible school for 70 years in a row. Right. However long ago that was, you add that to where we are now. And I don't know how, when that came, how many had been there before that. That's a long time. That's enough to qualify for a tradition. Right. We're going to call it that. Uh, it's a good one. And most references of the Bible, though, are negative. Let me read Mark chapter 7. We're going to read an account of Jesus' confrontation with the uh, Pharisees. And we find something about the tradition. Chapter 7 of Mark. Get verse 1. And the Pharisees and some of the, of the scribes who had come from Jerusalem gathered around him, around Jesus. And they observed that some of his disciples were eating their bread with unclean, that is, unwashed hands. For the Pharisees, in fact, all the Jews will not eat unless they wash their hands ritually, keeping the tradition of the elders. When they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they have washed. There are many other customs they have received that keep like the washing of cups and jugs, copper utensils and dining couches. Then the Pharisees and the scribes ask them, Why don't your disciples live according to the tradition of the elders, instead of eating bread with ritually unclean hands? And he answered them, Isaiah prophesied correctly about you hypocrites, as it is written. These people honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. They worship me in vain, teaching his doctrines the commands of men. Disregarding the command of God, you keep the tradition of men. He also said to them, you completely invalidate God's command in order to maintain your tradition. And Moses said to honor your father and your mother. And whoever speaks evil of father or mother must be put to death. But you say... If a man tells his father or mother whatever benefit you might have received from me is corbin, that is, it's a gift committed to the temple, then you no longer let him do anything for his father or mother, and you revoke God's word by your tradition that you have handed down, and you do many other similar things. Most references, again, to traditions in the Bible generally are negative because most of those traditions tend to be bad traditions. Most of them are called traditions of men, and usually run contrary to God's law. 
The definition, though, if you look in the Bible today, is quite simple one. It has nothing to do with good or bad, actually. It goes to the handing down of statements and beliefs, legends, customs, information, and other things from generation to generation, especially by word of mouth or practice. Didn't say bad or good, just so we hand down. Traditions can be found in many places in our everyday lives. We keep traditions many times without knowing or calling them a tradition. The keeping of birthdays and anniversaries is technically a type of tradition. Our cemetery memorial days are a type of tradition. Most holidays, including the one we just went through, the one we'll be going through in the next week or so, are observed traditionally. Last week I mentioned the traditional practice of many churches of holding two revivals a year. Church homecomings are traditions at many churches. So a lot of things that we do that uh, we call traditions, we may not be doing so often we're thinking about. My family, because my dad was a miner, they work, they got everybody at the same time, got two weeks of vacation right around July the 4th. So our tradition was when we got a vacation, it was 4th of July. Same time every year. Uh, close enough to be called a tradition if you will. In the Bible, though, we find the word tradition or traditions is only used 13 times in the whole scripture. And nearly all refer to the traditions of men that have, re have replaced some way God's word or God's command. Today we're going to look at traditions in our lives from both a good and a bad perspective. And we need some traditions for they enhance our lives in various ways. And we need to eliminate some traditions for they are outdated, they are dangerous, or they're useless in our lives today. Right. If we begin this week of BBS, let's be mindful of this rich tradition handed down to us from our church ancestor. And let us leave some worthy uh, traditions to those who will follow us here at Newman. The making of a tradition, first of all. Uh, again, in itself, a tradition is neither good nor bad. They become bad, which is what we find in our story from Jesus' life. Now, Jesus is not opposed to washing of hands before eating. And my mother would be opposed to not washing her hands before eating. But it was the manner in which that tradition originated that troubled Jesus. Go all the way back to Exodus chapter 30. Exodus 30. See, most of the traditions in a religious sense come from somewhere. Use it, take it out of context or whatever. But he, Exodus 30, read verse, 30, verse 17. The Lord spoke to Moses. He said, make a bronze basin for washing and a bronze stands for it. You set it between the tent of meeting and the altar and put water in it. So Aaron and his sons must wash their hands and feet from the basin. Whenever they enter the tent of meeting or approach the altar to minister by burning up an offering to the Lord, they must wash with water so that they will not die. They must wash their hands and feet so that they will not die, for this is a permanent statue for them, for Aaron and his descendants throughout their generations. So here, God gives Moses the directions that you build this basin of water, but it was for Aaron and the priest. But traditions, folks, become bad when they are given the same weight or value as uh, and are made legitimate the legal commands of God or the dictates of God. If we place a tradition alongside it and say it's the same, we've messed up. In the giving of the law, it was the priests who were to carefully wash their hands as they performed their duties in the tabernacle later in the temple. This was not because their hands were unclean. This was a ritual cleaning. This is what Mark told us, that they washed ritual, 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 ritually. Yeah, got it. In other words, hands don't have to be dirty. It's something you do because you do it. Yeah. And actually, when it, you, most of our rituals in church are supposed to mean something, or symbolize something, report something. Well, the clean hands, but you may have heard this, clean hands, clean heart. Right. I, mean, I didn't just come up with that. Okay. <laughs> but it works, I don't think it works real good. In other words, it wasn't something they had to do. The hands didn't have to be dirty. So don't wash your hands. In a real way, this is what baptism is a ritual. Ritual cleansing. It looks like you're washing away the sin. You go in the water and come up. Don't have a dirty body. It's a ritual cleansing, if you will. Now, the Pharisees, because they were zealous keepers of the law, added that ritual hand washing to the law for all Jews. Now, there are many things that have no basis in biblical truth that have become 
traditions for all groups and all denominations. And we do this in our churches today because much of what we do is not commanded or taught in our scriptures. Now, this can be good or bad, again, depending on how those traditions are used. The Pharisees used the traditions of theirs to add to the already unbearable weight of the law of Moses. The traditions of the Pharisees technically were not legally binding to anyone but the Pharisees, yet they made binding for right. they were they, they were the traditions of men, and Jesus understood where they came from. He understood the manner in which they were used, what was once supposed to be for Aaron and all the priesthood, and now been brought over and made for all the people. It's safe to say Jesus did not like them or keep them. We must never be careful of doing something until it becomes a tradition, folks, if it's not actually grounded in the Scripture. Amen. Now, it may not say to do it, just make sure it does not say don't do it. It must have some grounding in the Scripture for it to be a, a legitimate, good tradition. But there are those non-biblical traditions. Look at Colossians 2, verse 8, and they are found in the church. Colossians 2, 8. Paul again says, Be careful that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deceit based on human tradition, based on the elemental forces of the world, and not based on Christ. If I were to ask you to name some traditions in the church today, you might be hard-pressed to find them. Because so much of what we do, we do all the time. It's just what we do. But technically, they're probably traditions. However, every church has traditions, we do. Most of them are not spelled out in the Word of God. A highly respected man, and we've used him quite often here at the church as far as his writing stuff, he worked for churches for years, and he had a, 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 a listing recently of the top ten most fiercely defended traditions in churches. Uh -oh. Top ten. I'm not going to list all of them, but I was a little surprised at the top three. The first one was worship and music style. He did say that this is not an issue as it once was, but well, there's nothing scripturally that tells us how we're supposed to. All it says is to make a joyful noise. Right. I can make a noise all sorts of different ways. <laughs> I enjoy it. Don't I enjoy it? Y'all make noise. But that's all. After that, it's up to the church. And then the second one is order of worship service. You shall not change where the prayer goes. <laughs> where the offering goes. You don't change that. And third one is times of worship service. I've tried to change. It's tough. If I get up the same time on Sunday for 30 years, I don't want to change come 15 minutes early. <clears throat> Times work. Three most fiercely defended traditions in the church. And no, they're not found in the Bible. Right. Now, Brother Steve likes to tell us pastors that he, as he travels around to the churches and, and local associations, he finds different types of music. He finds different types of service orders. He finds different times of worship. He tells us he has been late several times because he didn't know the particular start time of the church. He just assumed it was going to be when most of them were. Five, when he got there, he was late. Right. It's amazing, folks, how many churches have split or died because of the failure to recognize that a controversial tradition is not grounded in the Scripture, but simply evolved over time as they were handed down from one generation to another generation. Yeah. There are so many other things that we could have listed, but the main point is that all churches have their traditions, and they can become distractions, hindrances. They can become stumbling blocks to any church. Yeah. Jesus really may not like our traditions either if they're not helping us to be the church right. he wants us to right. be. Yeah. And it was easy for Jesus to understand what the tradition of the Pharisees originated. He knew their minds. He knew what they were thinking. And churches like the Pharisees can become too proud of their traditions and treat them as thus saith the Lord. That ain't good. That's a bad. So how do they go bad? Jesus really made no bones here about his disdain for the tradition of the Pharisees after they found fault in the disciples' failure to wash their hands. In several places on different occasions, Jesus condemns them, this is the Pharisees now, for their bad traditions. Right. A, tra a tradition becomes bad when it becomes the reality. Right. Look at again, verses 1 through 3 in Mark 7. He says, they've gathered around him and they're complaining to Jesus now. I ask him, why aren't your disciples washing their hands before they eat? Because, verse 3, in fact, all the Jews will not eat unless they do. So the tradition of washing hands ritually had now become gospel almost. 
It was the reality. They had to wash their hands before they ate. Regardless. The God was very specific in how and all, how often the priests were going to ritually wash their hands. I'm going to learn how to say that for a minute. Ritually wash their hands. Tell them when they were supposed to do it, how they were supposed to do it, what they were supposed to wash them in. It was for the priest. And he was also pretty specific when he told uh, the uh, leper, uh, leper how they were supposed to cleanse their body. Look at uh, uh, Leviticus 14. Leviticus 14. Get to verse 1. The Lord spoke to Moses and said, This is the law concerning the person afflicted with a skin disease. This would be leprosy at that time. On the day of his cleansing, if the leprosy had been healed and he is going in and allowed back into society again, there were certain things he had to do in court, and, and a, a ritual cleaning was a part of it. He said, He brought, uh, be brought to the priest, he'll go outside the camp and examine him. If the skin disease had disappeared from the affected person, the priest will order two live clean birds, cedar wood, scarlet yarn, and hyssop be brought for the one who is to be cleansed. And then he goes on and gives an elaborate detail scheme of how they're supposed to do the sacrifice, how the one who has been cleansed from leprosy is supposed to be washed. Well, very specific, but for, again, not, the leprosy's gone. There's not washing to get rid of the leprosy because it has already been gone. And how about in uh, 2 Kings 5, 9 through 12, when Naaman <coughs> was told, you need to get rid of your leprosy, go down to the river and dip seven times. Right. Now, he didn't like it because of the dirty river, the muddy river. I've got pretty rivers, he said, back there in my home. But why can't he go there? But the reality was, you, if you want to be cleansed, you have to go and do it this way. This way. Now, folks, we take the reality many times, and once the reality is over, we hang on to them with our traditions. The Pharisees, with their, with their traditions, had made hand washing a law for all the Jews. To fail to wash your hands before eating was now sin to them. Keeping their tradition then was important as keeping the command not to keep. Hard to believe, but so. The original Ten Commandments had now become over 2,000 commandments. They were added by the Pharisees, and they were traditionally expected to be kept by not just the Pharisees, but by all of them. There was little or no separation between God's commands and the traditions of the Pharisees. Now, some of those traditions in churches today that have become the real thing would be, well, how about you have to use a certain type of Bible? Yeah. Church, some church. That's going to be the case before, before summer's over for some of us. <laughs> now, folks, let me tell you something. There are still churches who believe Jesus wrote the King James Version. And Paul carried it with him on his trips. Yeah. Also, we have churches who only sing out of a hymnal got a red back and shake notes. Or only those songs were written in the past decade. Hmm. Some churches traditionally baptize only in the river or move, or move in water. This wouldn't be acceptable up here. Folks, when our tradition becomes a reality, they have become bad traditions and they ought to be eliminated. Amen. Now the Pharisees were so focused on keeping the outside of the body clean, they forgot it was the cleansing of the heart that was the reality. Amen. Do we have those today even uh, who spend more time on cleaning a building than trying to lead people to becoming clean in the spirit? Yes. Tradition can become the reality, but tradition, unfortunately, can become the doctrine. Look at verses 6 through 8, again in, in Mark 7. He the first of all, he calls them hypocrites. These people honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. They worship me in vain, teaching as doctrine the commands of men. Now, when you think about it, traditions are usually recognized. They're usually known as traditions by most of those who use them and who keep them. We know they're not binding. It's not going to hurt anyone if, if we don't keep them. However, that's not what Jesus found as he conversed with these keepers of the law. The Pharisees had gone too far in keeping their traditions. They were now teaching them as doctrine. They're putting them on the same level as the Word of God. Right. Now, today, today there are those who teach for doctrine, and the other part of the gospel, if you will, those things that just aren't found in Scripture. Now, folks, we have to do a lot of reading between the lines. I've shared with you a lot of times, as long as you give me, it's something to read between the lines. But if it's there in black and white, it cannot be changed. 
often it's messed with. Right? And a lot of this, I'm afraid, is, is the case. Things such as requiring membership in a certain denomination in order to be a Christian. If you don't belong here, you, you won't get into heaven. It's a lot of, unfortunately, some Baptists believe that. Okay, I guess. But I think they're, I think they're going to find out differently. I think all of them will be honest with you. Amen. I think we'll leave our denominational card down here. Right, right. You know. Some require that messages, the Lord's Supper, baptism, all those things must be done only by certain individuals. Got to have, got to have a certain name. Got to have a doctor in front of your name or something like that. You got to have certain requirements in order to be able to do those things. And even the lot, uh, believe it or not, a lot require the giving of our offerings must be ten percent. Can't be eleven. Can't right. be nine. It's got to be ten percent. Yeah. Baptism must be done using a certain phrase or a certain word because the way you say it is a requirement for salvation. Now, this is true. We discussed with someone the other day that if you did not say, I baptize you in Jesus' name, you weren't baptized. You couldn't use anything else, which is why I don't, I don't use that. So. <laughs> Bad. Well, all of you have been baptized, and that's the case you're in trouble. <laughs> but I don't think you are. I don't think you are. Some years ago, uh, still at seminary, so it was two or three years ago, I was uh, yeah. just yeah. checking. Still, still, still awake. Still, still awake. I was coming back from New Orleans and just crossed the Alabama line and looking for a country music station. And I found a, a radio, I found a preacher. I told Betty, let's just listen, see what I found out. He belonged to, he belonged to Church of Christ. And I as he sounds like somebody I know. It, well, it was just some guy I had worked with several years, and uh, he had left the company, and I didn't, didn't have any idea what he went to or where he went, but I knew he was a member of the Church of Christ. Preacher, no. I said, let's just see how long he gets to the point where he says he has to be saved, or baptized to be saved. Sure enough, five minutes into his message, he, he said, what was a beautiful tradition, baptism, and you take it, make it in some kind of something you, ha you have to have, it's, it becomes part of the salvation message. Folks, that's a tradition that is bad. Amen. Bad. Amen. What was a tradition of the church to symbolize the changed life of one who had professed his or her faith in Christ was now to him an integral part of his doctrine. Right. We Baptists have our own traditions that have become doctrine for many in the church. They are most often bad traditions and they lessen the doctrine that really sets us apart and identifies us as Christians who believe in the preaching of the good news to all people. Tradition changes over time. But our doctrine, rooted in the Word of God, changes not. Right. Amen. Right. Amen. That's right. Now there are those today who, like the Pharisees, will find fault in the way we do things as a church. We have had those who visited us in the past who left and did not come back because they did not like one of our traditions. That was several times. Nothing to do with what we did it. Nothing to do with singing or preaching. Something about our tradition they did not like. But our own traditions then had become their reality and their doctrine. Right. But we can also be guilty if we are not careful in our own life. But we need what we leave, need to make sure we leave good traditions. Right. If you find the bad ones, we need to leave good ones. Yes. We we make them, we keep them, and we pass them on. Traditions are a part of our lives as individuals and as churches. Vacation Bible school has no commandment in scripture. But it's a good a good tradition began many years ago and handed down to us. We don't need to make this tradition good, for it's already good. Been good for years. But we need to leave some other good traditions to those who will follow us. Uh, verse 9, Mark 7, uh, Mark 7, he said, He also said to them, You completely invalidate God's command in order to maintain your tradition. In other words, you aren't teaching the Bible right. yeah. as they had. Now, you're probably thinking that we do that here at Liberty, and I would like to think that is true in every case. But if we, li we, do, we live in an age where so many people reject anything that claims to be truth for all people for all time. No, it changes over time. The truth, truth is just good for a particular time is what many folks say. Many folks believe that. Folks, we live in an age that many people reject it because they're into what we call subjective truth right. or truth that applies to the individual yep. and how he sees it at any point in time. But the Bible presents subjective truth or truth that's not dependent on how an individual or a group may see it because it comes from God, the ultimate. Right. Right. If the Bible was the basis for our faith, 
that it will transcend the whims of man, the fickleness of human emotion, or the attempts to twist and adapt it to our lifestyle, we would not have the problems in our world today. Right. It's beyond doubt that the moral and ethical mess we're in today is in large measure due to the way the churches have left the truth of God's word or the traditions of men. Right. Yeah. In a full-blown effort to pacify the world and become attractive to the masses, churches have substituted feel-good, self-help, and politically correct teachings for the truth of God's word. Amen. Now you might ask if, the, if preaching and teaching the Bible can be considered a tradition. Yes, especially if it's not biblically based and spiritually. If it's not something that God has given to us, we know it's God's given to us and the Spirit is guiding us as we do it. It, it can become simply a tradition. Now you all probably realize I don't claim to be the greatest preacher. One of them, but not the greatest. <laughs> But I do know I have not and will not reduce the Word of God to anything but the truth as I know. Right. I don't have to answer. <laughs> yeah, I do answer to you all, but I don't have to answer. But I do have to answer to God. That's right. Yeah. We have to answer to God. Yeah. Let's make sure that we leave to those who will follow a tradition of standing firm on the truth of the Scripture. Let's leave a tradition of not compromising with a world that tries to use God's words to validate their sinful lifestyles. Let's leave a tradition of love for the Bible that transcends any love for the traditions of man. So we need to teach God's Word, and we also need to live God's Word. Now Mark leaves us, uh, Jesus leaves us something in Mark, verses 10 through 13. A little story, technically, about how the Pharisees were misusing or mistreating the Scripture. It goes like this, honor your father and mother. This is something that Moses gave to you, he said. And whoever speaks evil of father and mother, they must be put to death. That was a, the law. Right. But you say, you Pharisees say, if a man tell his father or mother, whatever benefit or help you might have received from me is Corbin, that is, a gift committed to the temple, then you no longer let him do anything for his father or mother. Right. Then you revoke God's word by your tradition that you have handed down. And that's not always said you do other things. So not only did they teach their traditions as equal to God's word, they did not live themselves or expect others to live in accordance to God's right. word. So Jesus just lists this one tradition they had that broke a commandment, but it also caused difficulty and problems in the family structure of that day. God commanded his people, honor your mother and father, and they knew what that meant. In their old age, they needed to be taken care of. That was the children's responsibility. Now, this would usually mean there'd be a financial burden for the children that might keep them from giving as much to the temple offering or to the Pharisees. This was a commandment that was vital to both our and mother and father. It was a commandment vital to the time, uh, the, because it was the religious and the everyday life of the Jew. It was their social security, if you will. A tradition had cropped up that allowed a child to give the money intended for the upkeep of the parents to the temple. Now that sounds good on the outside. I'm giving a lot of money to the, to the church. But they were taking it from what was supposed to be given for the upkeep of the parents. Right. This was the scriptural, scriptural aspect. So in doing this, they were saying to those folks who did it, it's not sin. You don't have to follow the commandment to honor your father and mother give the money to us and let, let them go. In doing this, the Pharisees who allowed it and the children who did it revealed they were not living in obedience to God's command. Now we find many, uh, we find ourselves sometimes doing things that keep up, keep all of us from living our lives as God desires and expects. And again, they may look very spiritual on the outside, but in doing them, we have failed to literally keep God's will for us. Let me share just one of those with you that was listed in a report on bad church traditions. And it would speak, I think, to bad this morning about us because we are considered to be mission minded, missionary people. We focus on missions. It was this if we give to missions and pray for the missionaries as they go to all the corners of the earth, yet we fail to go to those in our neighborhood, our neighbors, our family, then we're doing exactly what those who held carbon, carbon to their parents as they let them left them to live in poverty and and nothing but ugly death. Folks, that's not living out God's word. Right. That's substituting a bad condition for a life that should be lived in obedience to God's will. 
Now, I will certainly hope and pray that we will hand down to our children and their children the tradition of teaching, teaching the truth of God's Word regardless of the cost. And I hope personally we're leaving a tradition of a life lived in obedience to God's Word. Now, when we do something that we have never not done, no. When we do something we've never not done, come out here, Linda. Oh, we do something because we've always done it. That's a t- tradition. Right. Tradition. That can be good, but more often it becomes bad, especially in church. Jesus was not opposed to the washing of hands before meals. He probably would have done it as a part of his life. And I would believe that in the presence of the Pharisees, it was just him and the Pharisees, he would do it in order not to offend them. Right. But to put that simple physical test on the level of God's commandments, he said was unacceptable. Our world, including our churches, are guilty of doing the same things occasionally. And let me give you a more modern scenario. Suppose someone entered the church and the message that day was on the theme, you must be born again. Upon leaving, the individual asked, why didn't you say that there are many roads to God? Or maybe the message was on God's creation of man as male and female. Someone may have questioned that they went out. Why why didn't you say a person can choose which gender he or she prefers? In other words, some are questioning, questioning the scriptures, and they're looking at their own traditions. So many in our world today have believed and practiced a lie for so long it's become a tradition to them. This is the best way to put it. What we do, what we believe, and what we teach is either in compliance with the Word of God or it is not. Right. It is not. We can do that which is contrary to the Bible thousands of times until it becomes a tradition, but it will always be a bad tradition, and it will always be sin. In like manner, we can obey God's word and make it a continuous practice in our lives and in our church until it becomes a tradition. And that will be a good tradition and one that God will bless. That's why Paul commanded the Thessalonians to follow the traditions they have received. And again, what we read earlier, brothers, stand firm, hold to the traditions you were taught. And you would not have told him to hold to the bad ones. You hold to the good ones that you've been taught either based on my message or by letter. Whatever you've heard from me or whatever I've sent you, those are what you need to do. And then we command you, brothers, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, keep away from every brother who walks irresponsibly and not according to the tradition received from us. Right. If we have a brother or sister whose tradition, who wants a tradition that's contrary to what we know from here, we can't do it. We can love them all we want to and should, but we cannot follow them. That's right. right. Amen. Let us leave by our teaching, folks. Let us leave by our teaching and by our practice those traditions that will enhance the acceptance of the truth of God's Word. It will encourage those who follow us to live godly lives in a sinful world. And most importantly, they will glorify the Lord. Right. Right. Traditions, man, Bible school is fantastic. It's hard to get any better. The ones that passed out to get any better because of all the good that it does. Most of the things we call traditions, again, just a matter of how we do service, how we conduct our business meetings, the things that don't really matter because they aren't, they aren't for or against the Word of God. It's up to us. Let's make sure those things we do over and over again are done for the right reason and done again in compliance with and not against what God says. Let's stand. Amen. Bow our heads for a moment. The Holy Spirit to speak to us and we'll ask Him to help us to know and understand our traditions, to use them in ways and manners that glorify God and not in ways frustrating, in ways that will allow the church to minister and, 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 and to grow as it, it should rather than being a hindrance or a stumbling block. Let's pray that God will give His blessings on this tradition to begin tonight. Uh, yearly, annually, who knows how long. God's blessed what we do in the Bible school and all the church of Bible school. They're good traditions. I thank you for Father, thank you for the day again and your word and what you teach us from your scriptures. 
Help us, Lord, to know and understand what is true, what is real. Set the Father as your word and pledge ourselves to, to, to believe it and to do it. Help us, Father, to teach those who are struggling with this what it means to, to know the, the Bible, to study the Bible, so we'll take it and apply it in their hearts. Pray, Lord, that what we'll do tonight, in a short time with a few children, uh, will be a way of establishing something in their hearts, in their lives. Tradition for us, Lord, but it'll be a way of doing something with them that will help them forever. Through this life, Father, and the next. Thank you for loving us and putting up with us. Thank you, Father, for helping us to know from time to time what we're doing and how we're doing it. To draw on the phone and help us to do that. Take charge of our days and this force refreshed. Give us, Father, again. Uh, for those times when we just fail to do what we, we should do as well as we've done what we used to do. We love you. We just thank you, Father, for Christ and salvation. Thank you for his the promise and the hope you have. Eternal life. Turn to him. We love you. Thanks for all these blessings in Christ's name. Amen. 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 And we remember all the great things you have done. We believe that greater things are still to come. Zero. 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 Okay. Now we know what's coming tonight. What time do we need to all five, hands on deck? 5.30, 5.40, somewhere around there. 5.30 would be nice if we're, I mean, I'm sure we'll have kids show up around then, so. Well, yes, I'm sure up today. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> they were looking for Bible school. That's what we like. Amen. Exciting. I do want to get a picture of everybody that's working down front real quick. We'll do a lot we usually do and get on the half circle and get a group photo of everybody that's helping in Bible school. Up here in front of the train station. Right in the other. Thank you and pray. And those of you who work, it'll all be over in a week. Right. You get to rest next week. I'm gonna give you the I'm gonna give you a holiday next week, you know, so. <laughs> I don't need to work in Bible school, huh? <laughs> Well, we just thank you so much for this day and the message that was brought for us. Uh, we just uh, pray that we would uh, just keep those good traditions that you've uh, instilled in us and uh, do what we can to eliminate the bad ones, Lord. We just uh, thank you so much for uh, Bible school this week. We just pray that uh, we know that uh, we do everything we're supposed to do, that you'll take care of the rest, and uh, it will just be a, a, a great success for you, Lord. We thank you again just so much for it. In your name we ask. Amen. 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 Brother Villager, Mike's the one. Did you turn it off? Did you? Okay, thanks. You were rattling. I'll grab a picture next uh, later.